is there going to be an artificial general intelligence? Is there a single principle on which intelligence in general will emerge? Or are we actually going to wake up in a decade or two decades and realize that there really was no such thing as AGI? There's different degrees of generalization that occurs across tasks, sure. But all entities are specialized for a specific suite of tasks that they're going to face. And the problem with fine tuning is you very quickly get this overfitting issue where um, it ends up overfitting to the small fine tuning data set and it loses its generalization. It's forgetting old tasks that it was able to do. This is it. I don't think this is a, a, a nuanced edge case. I think this is a foundational problem with the way these models work. And so, how does the mammal brain decide? when to incorporate new information um, and how to add it to my model of the world without interfering with other information is a huge outstanding area of research that I think is a key difference between how mammal brains are sort of simulating and modeling the world and how existing AI systems are doing it. Hello, and welcome to The Cognitive Revolution, where we interview visionary researchers, entrepreneurs, and builders working on the frontier of artificial intelligence. Each week, we'll explore their revolutionary ideas and together, we'll build a picture of how AI technology will transform work, life, and society in the coming years. I'm Nathan LeBenz, joined by my co-host, Eric Torenberg. Hello, and welcome back to The Cognitive Revolution. Today, I'm speaking with Max Bennett, co-founder of BlueCore and author of A Brief History of Intelligence, Evolution, AI, and the Five Breakthroughs That Made Our Brains. I bought this book immediately upon seeing the title. Because I've been asking myself for some time now, how many conceptual breakthroughs do we still need before AI systems will achieve functional parity with humans? The answer, of course, is that I really don't know. I would be surprised, but not totally shocked, if it turned out that attention really is all we need and that hyperscaling resolves all practical problems with no major architectural innovations. And on the other hand, I would again be very surprised if the number of breakthroughs needed turns out to be more than five. My best guess would be two or three, but that leaves major follow-up questions like what are the critical things that humans are doing, which AI systems are not yet capable of? Are physical embodiment and multimodal inputs necessary to our overall cognition, or are they just an artifact of our evolutionary history? How is it that we represent memories so efficiently and so usefully such that even a single experience can shape our behavior for life? How do we determine what new information to incorporate into our world models, what to reject, and what to remain uncertain about? Where does theory of mind come from, and is it necessary for adversarial robustness? And is some sort of hierarchical self-modeling needed for effective planning, and perhaps more importantly, for subjective conscious experience? These are huge questions, and as AI systems become more powerful and behave, on the surface at least, in more human-like ways, I believe it's also increasingly important to understand the key similarities and differences between human and AI cognition in the most literal, mechanistic terms possible. For that purpose, this conversation and the book on which it's based are extremely valuable resources. I definitely find myself referring back to the five breakthroughs that Max outlines as a lens through which to ponder new developments in AI. Of course, biological systems are extremely messy and constrained in ways that engineered systems are not. Whereas life has to maintain homeostasis continuously, AI models are mostly decoupled from specific hardware and humans maintain the data centers. And whereas evolution can only select for incremental changes which improve inclusive genetic fitness, human engineers can and sometimes do discover discontinuous step change advances. So, much like the flight of birds inspired and informed the Wright brothers' early airplane designs, but were ultimately eclipsed in speed and power by today's jet planes, so the history of human cognition can inform our understanding of new AI developments and our expectations for future systems, while in my view, and I believe Max would agree, certainly not representing a limit to their overall development. As always, if you're finding value in the show, we'd appreciate it if you'd take a moment to share it with your friends. A review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify would be amazing, but a simple tweet is also worth a lot. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoyed this conversation about the history of intelligence, biological and artificial, with entrepreneur and author Max Bennett. Max Bennett, co-founder of Blue Core and author of A Brief History of Intelligence, Evolution, AI, and the Five Breakthroughs That Made Our Brains, welcome to the Cognitive Revolution. So excited to be here. Excited to have you. 
So I've been on a journey recently that ultimately kind of led me to your book and to this discussion. And coming from you know my AI obsessive perspective, I've been finding myself thinking more and more about what is it that the human brain is doing that the AIs lack? You know, that was kind of the the motivation for me to say, you know, there's clearly some stuff here that we're doing <laughs> that the AIs are not doing, uh, but I kind of lacked a, a schema, a way to organize that. And so I, I went looking for, you know, who has done kind of a, a good taxonomy of the things that humans are doing that, you know, that I could kind of compare and contrast with. And it turns out that you've written at least, you know, a version of that book, which takes us through evolutionary history from some of the simplest organisms all the way through to today. And, and obviously, with your experience in AI, you, you can't help but get AI into the title these days and, and certainly have some discussion of, of that as well. But I'd love to just kind of maybe take this conversation in two parts. First, really flesh out the argument in the book. And then second, kind of see what we can take from that to inform our worldview and our expectations uh, about AI as well. To get started, you want to give just a little bit of kind of maybe your background generally, but also really interested in how to kind of how you've brought multiple different lines of thinking and scholarship together into the analysis that you've offered in this book. Sure. So my background is primarily in commercializing AI technology. So I spent the bulk of my career building a company called Bluecore, where we commercialized a bunch of deep learning models for large e-commerce companies. So recommender systems, we did a bunch of work on segmentation. This is sort of now pre-transformers AI. So, you know, like the old, the old fashioned AI. And so that was a really wonderful experience and journey. But what always perplexed me in taking these models and bringing them to real uh, use cases where you're trying to add business value um, is how perplexing the discrepancy has always been between what AI models or machine learning models are really good at and what the human brain is really good at. So, you know, back in the day, some very simple things that a human could do, like, you know, uh, have common sense about how you might put an outfit together were things that were astronomically difficult to get an AI model to have common sense about. These things are getting a little bit better now, but back in the day, that was like an incredibly uh, big challenge. So I always had this sort of curiosity about what is missing between uh, the brain and modern uh, AI systems. Um, and that sort of led me to this side project where I just started corresponding with neuroscientists um, via email. Uh, I started just reading textbooks, sort of just self-learning. Um, and that led me to a few interesting ideas uh, that led me to publish a few papers and collaborate with a few neuroscientists. And then they just started sort of snowballing into me having this idea for a book. And then I was just like, all right, I'm just going to take a year off and write it. And the whole time I was collaborating with a bunch of mentors of mine, uh, Dilip George, Carl Friston, uh, Joseph Ledoux, David Reddish. So these are all people that have become mentors of mine and have sort of guided me along the way and helped me realize ideas I had that were stupid. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that was a really wonderful journey. And then hence the book was, was created. To me, the kernel of the idea that makes the book unique is it really brings together three different fields of study that I think... Uh, wouldn't have been done without sort of a uh, outsider kind of coming in with just trying to piece things together. So the three fields of study are first, uh, evolutionary neuroscience. So this is the idea of uh, trying to piece together what is the story arc by which brains came to be over the last 600 million years. Even just the last decade has seen huge new pieces of, inner, of uh, knowledge emerge from this field. It's a relatively small field, actually. Um, but there's been some phenomenal studies and trying to actually piece together through looking at uh, different brains, in the animal kingdom, gene, uh, gene analysis, all these things have helped us really piece that story together. The second field is uh, comparative psychology, where we're actually analyzing what are the different cognitive and intellectual capacities of different species. Um, and that can be used, obviously, to try and back into paired with evolutionary neuroscience, what were the cognitive intellectual capacities of our ancestors, which is not really something that's been discussed. I wrote a few papers on that, which is how do we actually try to infer what, you know, the first mammals were capable of doing from what existing mammals can do, what non-mammalian vertebrates can do, and what evolutionary neuroscience suggests existed in their brain. And then the third field is AI, which I think is really essential to this, this whole exploration because AI really grounds us in uh, reality where I think fields of cognitive neuroscience, it, it's easy to get into a sort of philosophizing on, on concepts on how the mind works, which I think is great and fruitful and, and rich of insight. 
But what I like about AI is it really grounds us uh, in, do we understand what we mean by these concepts? If so, we should be able to implement a very basic form of it um, and test how well it works. So I think AI is sort of a litmus test for how well we understand what we're actually saying. And, and AI has really taught us a lot of our intuitions are wrong. Um, and that is, I, mean, I think reinforcement learning is perhaps the sort of best form factor here where, you know, and we'll get into this, but there's been lots of intuitions about how animals learn by trial and error. And it was only by actually trying to implement these things in machines that we learn, well, that intuition can't work because uh, we haven't. And then we learn, well, the way we actually get to work in machines, is this other approach, um, which actually does seem to be how brains do it. Um, so there's a really beautiful feedback loop. So in summary, uh, the idea of the book is to take comparative psychology, evolutionary neuroscience, and AI, merge them together, and try and craft a first approximation of how the brain came to be, and, and see if there's insights there for AI. I think there are some insights. I don't think it's necessarily an explicit roadmap for how to build AI, but I do think uh, as a first approximation, it illuminates aspects on how the human brain works and you know things that at least are different than how existing AI systems today are functioning. Cool. Okay. Well, I want to get into each of the five breakthroughs in just a second. But one thing that did jump out to me in reading the book and also watching some of the other interviews that you've done, which have, some of have been great, and definitely you know, recommend folks uh, going deeper down the Max Bennett rabbit hole uh, than we'll be able to do today. But throughout the book, one thing that you, know, you might expect to find, which you don't find, is a definition of intelligence. And I wonder, like, that would seem like a, you know, a good starting point. You obviously uh, skipped it. So why do you think we are maybe better off avoiding trying to define this term at all? Yeah, so it's a good, I've gotten that question a lot. So it's possible in retrospect, <laughs> I should have spoken to it more. I'll give you my reasoning. Um, my reasoning was when I cataloged all the existing definitions of intelligence, you know, some of the preeminent experts in the field define intelligence meaningfully differently, but their different definitions of intelligence don't lead them to approach the research agenda any differently. And so what to me that means is intelligence is, is this concept that uh, we all have an intuitive understanding for what we generally are interested in studying. Um, but once we try to pigeonhole it into a specific thing, it doesn't, the value of that, it's very hard to pigeonhole into one definition. And then there's not much fruit from that because we're still going to be studying the same sort of topic. So, you know, I had a great conversation with uh, Britt Cruz about this, where he, he defines intelligence as uh, learning. And I think that's a reasonable, you know, if it's just like intelligence is learning. Um, and I think it's a reasonable definition to go with. Um, but I don't know if it changes anything if you go with that definition versus, you know, Feifei's definition, which is a much broader one around some uh, an agent that can deal with uh, challenges and solve problems in a changing environment. You know, you could you could fathom uh, an entity that could solve the latter without having any learning. And so I kind of avoided it because I didn't think it would change the story uh, much. But and I don't think I have like a definition that I find satisfying. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I do think that's a, I, you know, I do think there's a, a lot of time wasted, certainly debating <laughs> definitions and debating from definitions. So I can certainly see um, some possible wisdom in, in just kind of skipping that step. And I, I do also think that one of the things I've learned from AI is just that there's a lot of weird stuff out there, <laughs> you know, so you can kind of blind yourself in some ways if you you know, we, we have these, I see these debates all the time, like, you know, does it really, does it understand? Does it really understand? You know, so that it seems to lead nowhere. I do think it, it brings up something um, maybe deeper where, you know, there's a little bit of a schism where I think I would fall on one side of the schism where, you know, is there going to be an artificial general intelligence? Is there a single principle on which intelligence in general will emerge or are we actually going to wake up in a decade or two decades and realize that there really was no such thing as AGI? There's different degrees of generalization that occurs across tasks, sure, but all entities are specialized for a specific suite of tasks that they're going to face. And I kind of more fall in the latter category, which Jan LeCun talks about. Um, and so what I think that kind of means is when we talk about intelligence, what we're talking about 80% of the time is we want something that feels very human-like. Um, that's sort of what we're pursuing. And when we mean something human-like, what we're actually talking about is a suite of capacities. It's not really one capacity that we're trying to recreate, not only because we think it can benefit humanity, but because we're really interested in understanding ourselves. And so, so I, my hunch 
my hunch is that we're going to end up realizing that there really is no one panacea AGI. There's some general principles that we can probably apply, um, but we're going to have intelligences that are specialized to certain domains. Well, let's get into the kind of main structure of the book itself. So as the title promises, you've got five breakthroughs. I will just give the one word label for each one, and then we can kind of unpack each in turn. So the, the, the five breakthroughs, number one, steering. Number two, reinforcing. Number three, simulating. Number four, mentalizing. And number five, speaking. So let's get started with steering. We're going all the way back to the age of small worms, and uh, they're figuring out some of the most basic stuff. So tell us that uh, the story of that first breakthrough. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. The Brave Search API brings affordable developer access to the Brave Search Index, an independent index of the web with over 20 billion web pages. So, what makes the Brave Search Index stand out? One, it's entirely independent and built from scratch. That means no big tech biases or extortionate prices. Two, it's built on real page visits from actual humans, collected anonymously, of course, which filters out tons of junk data. And three, the index is refreshed with tens of millions of pages daily, so it always has accurate, up-to-date information. The Brave Search API can be used to assemble a data set to train your AI models and help with retrieval augmentation at the time of inference, all while remaining affordable with developer-first pricing. Integrating the Brave Search API into your workflow translates to more ethical data sourcing and more human representative data sets. Try the Brave Search API for free for up to 2,000 queries per month at brave.com slash API. Real quick, what's the easiest choice you can make? Taking the window instead of the middle seat, outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded, and when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time, Plus, Shopify magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash cognitive. Go to shopify.com slash cognitive now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash cognitive. Yeah, so 600 million years ago, uh, the world was a really fascinating place. If you woke up and you were navigating around the world 600 million years ago, there was really no life on land. So if you looked at earth from, from space, it wouldn't be green. There were no trees yet. And pretty much all of life was in the oceans. And most life was single cellular, um, but there were some multicellular organisms starting to uh, emerge. And the three branches of life uh, had sort of already, uh, the three branches of eukaryotic life, which is uh, the life that we're made out of, um, these really complex cells, um, had already sort of branched off. There was the fungi lineage, there was the animal lineage, and there was the plant lineage. And so uh, we don't really have a great understanding of what uh, fungi looked like back then, but there's some evidence that there were sort of mushroom-like structures under the under the ocean, um, probably quite small. Uh, there were some plants-like structures in the ocean, um, probably close, most resembling like seaweed uh, of today. Um, and then there were animal structures. Um, and just so much debate about what these early animals looked like. We don't know for sure. Um, but most evidence suggests that these really early animals were most akin to today's cnidarians, uh, which is a, a class of animals that includes sea an anemones, jellyfish, um, coral polyps. And what's interesting about all of these creatures, which the, some fossil evidence suggests early animals were akin to, 
is they have no brains. So they have nerve nets. So they have this so web have of neurons. Um, that are largely implementing independent reflexes. And so if you take a, a uh, coral polyp, which is this like radially symmetric, if you look at a coral, um, if you zoom in, they're actually all these independent little polyps, which have like these little tentacles and there's a little stomach and they're radially symmetric. Meaning if you put a uh, sort of, they're, they're symmetric around a central axis. And what is key about like a coral polyp is they're not navigating around to find food. So they're not, they're not pursuing food. They're not avoiding uh, predators. What they're primarily doing is they have their tentacles out in the water and they're waiting for small clumps of food to hit their tentacles and then they grab the food in and they consume it. And what's interesting about, about them is they don't have a lot of cognitive capacities. Now, there is independent convergence. So there's some really interesting studies that suggest today, after 600 million years of evolution, some cnidarians may have a uh, like box jellyfish may have gotten a little bit smarter and gotten the ability to do some lightweight navigation, et cetera. So, so there, that might've happened, but I do think most would agree that these early cnidarians didn't have these capacities. We've tried to find things like associative learning in coral polyps. We have not found them. So they can't even associate, uh, the, the presence of a light with a shock and then retract to the presence of that light. That very basic association doesn't even occur. So the question is, how do we go from this web of, of neurons to brains. Um, and this is sort of the first, the first breakthrough, which is steering. And what's, what's key about evolution, which makes evolution like amazing, but then also so perplexing is despite you getting this crazy complexity at the end of 600 million years, every, every change needs to be selected for. So evolution doesn't have forethought. So it can't say, oh, you know, what would be really valuable is if we actually consolidated all these neurons into this design. Um, because that would enable us to have all these capacities. So let's just do that next generation. No, there has to be small incremental changes that lead to a result. Every generation has to survive. So it's a very uh, constraining process. So the first brain needed to, to be uh, simple enough to be something that could be selected upon. So it couldn't just jump from you know coral polyp to human brain, obviously. Um, and it needed to have adaptive value. So when we look into, you know, around 600 million years ago, 550 million years ago, the first animals with brains emerge. Um, and there are some interesting features of them. One, they were little worm-like creatures uh, about the size of a grain of rice, fossil evidence suggests, very, very small. Um, and unlike the animals that came before, um, like cnidarians, they had bilateral symmetry. Um, and that means symmetry across a central plane, which um, all humans are, arthropods are, uh, all mammals are. And a, a good organism uh, that people use as a sort of proxy organism for the first uh, bilaterian, which is the class of animals with bilateral symmetry, which is the first class of animals that have brains, it, are nematodes. Um, they're very small, uh, worm-like animals. And so the most classic uh, nematodes, the elegans, has 302 neurons. I mean, it has like it's like a hopelessly simple brain. But we've studied nematodes deeply and they have a credible suite of cognitive capacities. And so the question is, what did this first brain do? So why did this first brain emerge? Why do we go from nerve nets to this consolidated uh, sort of brain and the center or head of these animals? And if you look at a nematode and compare it to uh, sort of a coral polyp, there's a few things that would obviously immediately emerge. First is it's moving around a lot. So the strategy of a coral polyp, which is wait for food, is very different than a nematode strategy, which strategy, which is I'm going to go pursue food. And what's interesting about a nematode is it does a, a remarkably good job of finding food and getting away from dangers, but it doesn't see anything. I mean, if you look at the sensory apparatus of a nematode, it is hopelessly simple. Uh, it doesn't have eyes, lens shaped eyes. Um, it just has a very basic suite of neurons for detecting certain smells. I'm in detecting the presence of light and some very basic sensory neurons for detecting, you know, pressure and touch. And yet it does a phenomenal job finding food. And so um, the way it does this is with a technical term is called taxis navigation. I call it steering just for, you know, to be cute. Uh, but taxis navigation is this idea that you don't actually need to understand the structure of the world to find things if you have gradients of sensory information that you can pursue. So smell is a good example. So if you place a little uh, morsel of food in a petri dish, um, it creates a smell gradient around it, which is just a feature of how the physics of um, chemicals diffused within a fluid, where 
the presence of the smell chemicals will be in higher concentration the closest the closer you go to the origin. And so these early bioterians look at a nematode, actually realize I can solve the navigation problem, how to find food without this jump to a rich sensory apparatus. If all I do is implement a very basic algorithm, which is when I make an action that uh, detects an increasing concentration of food smell, just keep going in that direction. When I take an action that detects a decreasing concentration of a food smell term. And so this very simple algorithm of steering or taxis navigation enables them to turn away and get away from dangerous predator smells and get towards food smells without understanding anything about the, the, the structure of the world, without understanding, without any sensory apparatus that enables me to detect objects and recognize objects or any of that. But in order to do this, you need a brain. Um, you need to get to the point where there's a consolidated nucleus of neurons because you need to make trade-offs now. You can't have distributed web of, of reflexes. For example, a, a nematode is going to face uh, competing inputs. Um, so one of my favorite nematode studies is they put a bunch of nematodes on, on a Petri dish where they put food on one side and they put a copper barrier uh, in the middle and, and nematodes hate uh, copper. Now, what they found is they will readily make trade-offs between do I cross this dangerous copper barrier, which is toxic to them, to get to the other side to get food. And it depends on two things. One, the relative concentration of each of these. The higher the concentration of the food, the more willing they are to cross. And two, how hungry they are. So they incorporate their internal signals. The more hungry they are, the more willing they are to cross the copper barrier. So in order to do this, I need to integrate two different sensory neurons, one that detects bad things that triggers turning, and one that detects good things that triggers forward momentum into some central nucleus so I can make a single choice as to what is my movement. So yeah, so so the, that the idea is, which is not really particularly novel, I think most people uh, in the field you know, would agree with the general idea that taxis navigation was probably the, uh, the movement algorithm implemented by the first bilaterians. Um, and from taxis navigation came several principles of intelligence on which the rest of the brain evolution ensued, which is why I think it's so interesting. First and foremost is this notion of valence, um, which in the AI community, people would just call reward. Um, I wouldn't call it reward yet in bilaterians, but the idea is you classify things in the world into good and bad. So in order to implement the, the algorithm of taxis, what you need to do is say there are certain stimuli that I deem good and there's certain stimuli that I deem bad. They directly map to a certain mo a movement repertoire, which is turn towards or turn away from it. If you look at a nematode, what's so interesting is the sensory apparatus directly signals valence, which is not like a human. So this is where you can start seeing simplicity become more complex. When I show a human a stimulus, the neurons in your eye do not directly encode the valence of that stimulus. Whether or not you deem it good or bad or rewarding happens deeper in the brain. But when you look into a nematode brain, that's not the case. They have neurons that detect food smells. These neurons directly map to neurons that trigger forward momentum. So the 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 effectively it's evolutionary hard evolutionarily hard coded what things are good and what things are bad. It's not learned over the course of their their life. Now they can change the relative weights of good and bad things um, based on learning, but there's a very strong bias that's implemented. So that's the idea of tax navigation. From tax navigation comes valence and this notion of reward. There's also something uh, called affect, um, which is sort of the basic template of emotions that emerged with nematodes. That, this is part of the book that I find really fun to learn about, where if you also look at uh, how a nematode navigates, uh, there's another complexity that emerges. So what I told you is actually not exactly correct when I said that you put a morsel of food and it creates the smell gradient. That's true in a Petri dish. It's not true in the real world. Um, if you actually look at smell gradients in the real world, the problem is there's a lot of noise because there's a lot of uh, other uh, noisy smells that occur and there's lots of currents. So if you actually look at a smell plume from a source, it's actually very noisy. It dissipates not in a clean gradient. It's like sort of whiffing around. And that creates a problem because if you actually implemented exactly the algorithm I suggested, it wouldn't be very effective because it's very common that if a nematode passed an area rich with food, it wouldn't get a consistent smell gradient leading them to the source of that food. So what nematodes do is they actually have uh, what people in the field would call behavioral states, um, which I think maps very nicely to what people in, uh, who study other types of animals would call affective states, which is uh, a behavioral repertoire triggered by a stimulus, but persisting beyond the presence of that stimulus. So nematodes have uh, dopamine neurons that, unlike 
us actually have an apparatus that sticks outside of the, the body of the animal. So our dopamine neurons don't have direct access to the external world. So they're deep within the midbrain of, of a human, and they only get information from other parts of the brain. The nematode, which perhaps suggests is suggestive of how dopamine evolved in early bilaterians, actually detects things outside of the worm. Um, and what are no dopamine neurons detecting? The presence of food. And so what happens? What happens is when a nematode passes a patch of food, it floods the brain with dopamine, which triggers a persistent state of what people call dwelling, which is local area restricted search. And so what this means is it's a, it's a clever, relatively simple mechanism for saying, if I detect food, it is a feature of the world that it's probably likely there's other food nearby. And that's, that's, that's evolution taking advantage of a feature of how the structure of the, our world works. That's not necessarily the case, but in our world, that happens to be the case. So a clever algorithm is to say, if I detect food, a food smell, I'm going to continue doing local area restricted search for some period of time until I find other food. I um, mean, so dopamine is a mechanism for triggering this sort of state of dwelling or exploitation or seeking, um, which we see dopamine doing in early bilaterians and then persisting through a whole, our whole lineage, which is a cool, I think. Then there are serotonin neurons that detect food in the throat of a nematode, um, which generates a state of rest and satiation. Um, in other words, after consuming food, it's the thing that makes the, the, the nematode pause and say, okay, I've consumed enough food. So this basic dichotomy between dopamine and serotonin, obviously has been complexified over 600 million years of evolution, but we see that very basic template, which is dopamine is the seeking pursuit chemical and serotonin is the satiation delayed gratification uh, chemical. So, so I guess one more analogy before we can jump to uh, breakthrough two is you see this algorithm also implemented in things like the Roomba, right? So uh, Roomba, uh, which is the um, sort of uh, robot that goes around and, and does uh, vacuum cleaning around your house, I think has some cool analogies to the early bilaterians because um, what Rodney Brooks did, who also kind of has an evolutionary lens on building uh, autonomous systems, um, built the simplest possible robot. Um, which is, and it's akin to the bilateral in the sense that it actually modern ones do build a map of your world of your home, but early ones did not build any map It all it would do is detect if it hit something and then it would turn randomly, which is akin to taxes navigation. But what they did is they realized that a problem with the Roomba is it wasn't taking advantage of detecting dirty things and cleaning up the whole area. So it was taking too long. So they implemented something called dirt detect, which is almost exactly how dopamine works in bilaterians. If a Roomba detects dirt, it actually stops its normal behavioral repertoire and starts turning in a local region. And the reason is because it's likely the case if it runs into a patch of dirt on the floor, there's other patches of dirt nearby. Uh, so it's the same exact basic principle um, on which sort of dopamine started functioning. So this is what the sort of the first brain did. And I'll pause there if there's anything. I know I just did a bunch of talking at you. <laughs> is there anything yeah, you want to add or ask? Hey. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamline accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash cognitive. That's netsuite.com slash cognitive to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash cognitive. Omniki uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in Omniki so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a, it's a great foundational overview. If, do I recall correctly that there are sort of neurons that encode these like somewhat higher order concepts in the brain or is that not there yet? I'm kind of making an analogy in my own mind to interpretability work on AI systems where people will, you know, go in and try to identify sort of higher order concepts, right? And I had thought that there were sort of 
internal neurons that that kind of fired for keep going or you know totally so there's uh, the people on the nematode community who call them interneurons uh but yes yeah, so there's there's sensory so the sensory neurons that detect um sort of positive valence things negative valence things in the nematode which all connect to downstream neurons in the brain which then mutually inhibit each other so there's um, and i'm simplifying slightly but there's neurons that in general code for forward momentum and there's other neurons that ge in general code for uh, turning and these through a rel somewhat complex web end up mutually inhibiting each other and those connect to downstream neurons that that control uh sort of the the locomotion uh, motor program in nematode so so yes there are sort of intermediary neurons um, which is important because what you need is to integrate inputs from multiple positive valence neurons and multiple negative valence neurons and eventually get to the point where you're making a single choice. Um, so, so yes, there are intermediary neurons for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. So even there, you can kind of see, you know, the beginning of an analogy to even a transformer, you know, which is many, many more uh, neurons, but this same kind of structure of like the input layer that sort of works up into these higher order concepts in the middle layers and then cash out to some behavior on the other end, it only takes 302 neurons in a brain to have like a, an early form of that, which is pretty amazing. I would say, let's keep going. So breakthrough number two is, is reinforcing. Tell us that story. So, okay. So, um, if you fast forward, uh, around 50 million years from when the first spilaterians were sort of swimming around the seafloor, you enter the, the Cambrian period, um, and probably many listeners are familiar with the Cambrian explosion. And this is where you get this massive diversification of life. And for the most part, it's bilaterian life. So the explosion of life that occurred during the Cambrian period are the ancestors of our bilaterian ancestors or the, the ancestors, the explosion of life you get descend from our bilaterian ancestor. And most of the, the dominant species during the Cambrian period are actually arthropods, uh, which are the sort of uh, class of animals that include things like insects, although insects had not emerged yet, um, spiders, uh, crustaceans. Um, and so vertebrates, these are the invertebrates, vertebrates, which we are, the uh, animals with a vertebral column, were sort of small, uh, in general, middle of the food chain creatures. Uh, and they resemble, most resemble the modern fish. And these were our ancestors. So within this sort of explosion of huge arthropod predators, um, and some of them are massive, like the size of, it, of a human, uh, there was a, a little fish-like ancestor that was sort of swimming around. And, and this fish-like ancestor uh, evolved the, the very basic template of the vertebrate brain. And um, what I found actually most fascinating when I started going back and reading about all of this is... Uh, most studies on comparative psychology and really neuroscience in general are done on mammals. So there's, you know, rats are sort of the mainstay of neuroscience research. And there's some work done on fish, but it's, you know, a very small minority. But when you look at all vertebrate brains, if you want to know about the human brain, the fish brain kind of gets to you 70% of the way there because the fish brain has the very basic templates of, of all vertebrate brains. They contain a forebrain, a midbrain, um, a hindbrain, um, the very basic uh, substructures that maybe listeners have heard about. For, there's a cortex in a, in a fish um, that gets sensory information and recognizes patterns. It projects to the thalamus and the basal ganglia, which work in largely the same way. And there are uh, midbrain structures for dopamine, like all of the basic, the basic template of how vertebrate brains work, you find in a fish. And so, uh, what was going on in this very early brain? I think we can get insight from by looking at non-mammal vertebrate brains. Um, mammal brains have some very unique structures to talk about in breakthrough three. So, uh, in the in the vertebrate brain sort of template, some of the most important structures that you see are something called the cortex and something called the basal ganglia. And uh, what is not as appreciated, I think, in sort of the neuroscience community writ large is that the, there is a cortex in uh, fish brains. Um, so a lot of people think about how the cortex evolved only in mammals, but there is a cortex in fish that performs somewhat similar processes. It gets similar types of projections back and forth between the basal ganglia and, and the, the cortex. And so what are all these things doing? Well, um, if you look at what a fish is capable of doing, um, one of the most obvious things that it can do is it can learn from trial and error 
way better than uh, a nematode could. Um, so you can just go on YouTube and watch uh, people train fish to do crazy things. You can train a fish to jump through hoops. You can train a fish to navigate through a maze. And uh, you cannot train a nematode to do any of these types of tasks. And one of the interesting things about looking into the very basic template of a vertebrate brain is you start seeing uh, the reward signal, um, which uh, you know doesn't really exist in the same way in a nematode, uh, now becoming dopamine. So I'm going to go back in time to uh, the early 20th century, um, where we were really going, we were starting to learn about learning theory in general. This is guy Edward Thorndike, and uh, he originally wanted to uh, study human learning, uh, and he couldn't get uh, the school, the his sort of program to let him study human children. So he ended up studying chickens instead, which I think is a really funny story. Uh, but he thought, you know, in general, he was a starch Darwinist. He was like, okay, if we can find the principles of how uh, simple animals like cats and birds learn, then maybe it applies to human children. And what he originally was looking for was, um, can we teach these animals through imitation learning? Um, so he wanted to find a notion of insight and imitation. So the way he set this up is he created these puzzle boxes, which are these famous uh, studies that he did. And he would put like a cat in this uh, a cage put some food outside of the cage that they were obviously motivated to get to. And uh, there would be some very basic contraption in the cage that if the cat did the right thing, the cage would open, they get the food. So sometimes it'd be a latch that if they pulled, the cage would open. Sometimes he would just sit there and watch. And if they licked a certain uh, paw, he would open the cage. So effectively, there was a puzzle they had to solve. And so he was expecting to find two things. The first was that when they figured out how to do it, the time to get out would immediately go to zero. This was his notion of insight. In other words, once you figure out the puzzle, then you never need to someone else to tell you how to do it again. And the second thing he thought he would find was imitation learning. So if you put another animal in front of them who had already figured out how to do it, they would become faster. And at least in his studies, he didn't find either of those things. But what he did find is there was a progressive decline, uh, almost like steady curve um, of them figuring out how to get out of the cage. And so he thought about this effectively. He called this the law of effects, um, but really it's just trial and error learning. What he realized is what animals do is they just try a bunch of random things and they become on average more likely to do the things that, that worked and less likely to do the things that did not work. In other words, after I get out of the cage, it reinforces um, the prior behaviors that I took um, and makes them more likely to occur. So it's not insight in the sense of, oh, I figured out the puzzle. Um, but it's making me more likely to take behaviors that I just did before. And over time, eventually the time it takes to get out of the cage went to zero. So, so he came up with this idea of like, man, I wonder what portion of learning is just trial and error learning. And then, uh, this guy, BF Skinner ended up taking this to the extreme and tried to claim that all learning across all animals was just, uh, trial and error learning, which has been proven to be false, which we'll get to in breakthrough three. But, uh, the interesting insight is. Uh, a surprising quantity of behavior, intellectual behaviors is in fact trial and error learning. And so this is where uh, the second breakthrough with uh, reinforcement learning comes around. Because if you look at fish, um, the same sort of puzzle experiments uh, can be done on fish and they learn in exactly the same way. Um, so uh, Thornbeck actually did this because uh, he did. He was interested in studying fish. You can t put a fish uh, in a uh, tank and you can put these uh, these uh, sort of walls in the tank with certain areas where they can swim through. So only like certain sections they can get to. And then you make one area light, which they don't like, and one area dark they do like, and see how long it takes the fish to get through the puzzle. Um, the same exact thing will happen. It first takes them a long time, then it takes them slightly less, and eventually they do it immediately. If you take a nematode, you don't see this happen. You cannot train a very basic bilaterian to learn through trial and error in this way. So something happened in the jump from bilaterians to early vertebrates. And so uh, this guy, so this is where AI actually is a really fascinating part of the story. So we have tried to implement algorithms the way that Thorndike believed that reinforcement learning worked, which is when a good thing happens, you reinforce recent behaviors. So Marvin Minsky, um, I think it was in the 50s, uh, he creates something called SNARK, which I forget exactly what it stands for, a stochastic neural analog reinforcement calculator, <laughs> I think, which is a very basic algorithm that was trying to learn how to teach uh, something to get out of a maze, a very basic little AI agent to get out of a maze and just reinforce it whenever it succeeded. So the idea was, hey, let's take the idea that Edward Thorndike had, apply it to an AI system and watch it learn through trial and error. Does not work. And the reason it doesn't work is because of something called the temporal credit assignment problem, 
which is um, most actions that lead to good rewards are not directly proximal to the reward. Um, and so a good analogy would be a game of uh, chess. When you play chess with someone, the things you took, the actions you took that led you to win are not necessarily the actions at the very end of the game. The things that might have won you the game might have been in the middle of the game. And so when all you do is just reinforce the recent behaviors, you don't end up getting a very uh, smart agent. And if you try and reinforce all the behaviors, it takes way too long. You need way too much data to actually get it to learn how to play a good game of chess. So this was a, a, a huge problem for decades in AI where we could not figure out how to get trial and error learning to work. And which, uh, when it eventually was discovered, which I'll describe in a second, it actually ends up illuminating uh, how vertebrate brains work because we can see very similar algorithms being implemented. So this uh, guy, Richard Sutton, came up with this brilliant idea where um, maybe the way that trial and error learning works is we don't reinforce ourselves when we get the actual reward. We The reinforcement signal comes from changes in predicted reward. And so it's this idea that when you're playing a game of, of chess, there's actually two opponent processes happening. There is one process that's trying to predict what's the best next move. But then there's a separate process that's trying to predict how good is my current state? How likely am I to win? Another way of just saying, what's my expected future reward? And his idea was maybe the reward signal that trains the system, the, the policy network, which is the network that's deciding what move to take, is not when you win. It's the expectancy of the move you just took increased the likelihood of winning substantially. So we, there's some intuition here, which is when you're playing a game of chess, and when you make a move where you're like, oh man, my position just dramatically improved, that feeling, that rush, that's the reinforcement signal. And so uh, his idea of temporal difference learning, which is the idea of the reinforcement signals, temporal differences, uh, changes in expected future reward is actually what reinforces uh, brains. This is the insight that unlocks sort of the reinforcement learning revolution. So um, the first sort of practical application was uh, something called TD Gammon, um, where this principle is used to make uh, backgammon games work really well. It has since been applied to far more complicated games um, like chess um, and checkers, et cetera. So um, this is this idea that, man, the way to get reinforcement learning to work is you need to have an ongoing prediction as to what the likely future reward is. Okay. So now we go back to fish brains, which are eminently capable of learning through trial and error. And we look at the structure called the basal ganglia, which is one of, I think, the coolest parts of the brain. I won't uh, bore people with the nuances of uh, how it works. But if you're interested in like neuroanatomy, I think learning about how the basal ganglia works is one of the most tantalizing structures because for two reasons. One, it is a beautiful mosaic structure. So it, it, the way it works is like so clear versus if you look at a place like the neocortex, it's a complete mess. It's very hard to decode what's actually happening. And then two, it's incredibly conserved across animals. The basal ganglia in a fish works almost exactly the same way as the basal ganglia in a human. And so no one knows exactly what it's doing, um, but there's some pretty strong theories that is implementing something quite akin to Sutton's uh, TD learning algorithm, because what we see is this mosaic in the basal ganglia between um, circuits that attach to the brainstem motor system that bias actions in one way or another on the basis of dopamine bursts. So when it gets dopamine, it becomes more likely to do an action. And when it gets a decline in dopamine, it becomes less likely to do an action. And we actually know the exact circuitry for how that happens. And there's a mosaic within the basal ganglia that projects back to dopamine neurons that seems to trigger increases in dopamine and also pause dopamine signaling. In other words, reinforcing and punishing itself based on its expectation of future reward. So there's a lot of people that have done some modeling and tried to map the neuroanatomy of basal ganglia to Sutton's idea of TV learning, still open area of research, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that what it's doing is something quite similar to this. And when you record dopamine neurons, this is the best evidence for this, and this hasn't been done in fish, but if you do it in monkeys or mice, dopamine neurons seem to signal almost exactly the TD learning signal. So what you see is phasic dopamine, so big bursts of dopamine excitement occurs not on reward delivery, but on changes in expected future reward. So, so if you are you know, if you hook up the dopamine neurons within a monkey, when a, a cue appears that it thinks is predictive of a future reward, that's when it gets a big burst of dopamine, not when you actually give it the reward. 
Um, and that actually was a big perplexing finding in neuroscience until people realized that Sutton's TD learning works in practice and they realized, well, this is a new interpretation of what dopamine neurons are doing. So uh, if you go into a fish brain, there is good evidence. We haven't recorded, to my knowledge, we haven't recorded dopamine neurons directly, but you have recorded the surrounding structures um, that do show these sort of prediction error signals. In other words, it's triggering excitement when something just changed that suggests you're about to get a positive reward or a negative reward. So the evidence suggests that fish brains are doing this sort of same TD learning algorithm to enable them to learn from trial and error. What I think is so cool about this sort of breakthrough too, is it's only possible if you have breakthrough one. You cannot implement a TD learning algorithm without having a grounding notion of valence at the bottom of it. In other words, a notion of what is good and bad in the first place. That is the baseline on which expected future rewards are built on top of because you need the actual reward signal, which only existed with taxis navigation and nematodes, because that's what classified true, good, or bad things. So from this idea of reinforcement learning, you get all these other things that emerge in vertebrate brains, because now once you can learn arbitrary behaviors through trial and error, all these other things become possible. For example, now it's really useful to recognize more things in the world because that enables me to have more complex suites of actions I can take on the basis of way more things I could recognize. So the cortex is one of the structures that evolved in early vertebrates that seems to do things like pattern recognition. Some fish can recognize human faces. So they're very, very good at pattern recognition. Another thing that emerges in early vertebrates is a map of 3D space. A simple study for this is if you have a grid of, let's say, 25 different containers, the only cue for where you are in this map of space, let's say one side of the wall of this tank maybe has like a blue dot. So you can, you, wherever you're placed, theoretically, you have sufficient information to build a map of the space. And let's say you put a morsel of food under one of these containers, an arbitrary place in this grid of 25. Eventually, a fish will find that location. If you put a fish back in the tank without any food, it will go right back to the same location, irrelevant of where you place it. And so this is not, and this is an interesting biological tweak on standard uh, reinforcement learning agents. It's not actually just learning the suite of egocentric actions to take. In other words, what move do I turn right or left in response to a cue? It has something a little more advanced, which is given my location in a 3D space, what is a homing vector to a, another location that I would like to be? At? And so that's a much more effective way to engage in trial and error learning because it's much more robust to changing and changing starting locations and all of that. So you can go into a fish brain, you can see the homologous region of the cortex, which ended up evolving into our version of the hippocampus, uh, which seems to encode locations in 3D space, which is a, just a useful tool, which will end up mattering for breakthrough three. So yeah, so with, with vertebrate brains, you get arbitrary trial and error learning with the basal ganglia, you get the cortex, which can learn arbitrary patterns, which enables the basal ganglia to learn more complex behaviors because it can recognize more things in the world. Any questions on that? So the questions I have following up on this reinforcement, I guess one is just kind of an observation that we do see this dual model pattern across a number of different places in AI specifically, right? Like the GAN architecture is not exactly this, but it's it's a similar thing where you've got the generator and the discriminator and they kind of bootstrap together to higher capability. More salently to the frontier models of today, the reinforcement learning from human feedback is predicated also on a reward model that is going to score something, you know, with its estimate of what a human would score it as. And then by applying that to outputs, now you can, you know, reward the better outputs from the, the core model. So those are both interesting. Also, the rewarding incrementally along the way has become a big trend that was key to, and I think it's probably used in many places, but one that stands out to me is OpenAI's result from, I think like first, maybe second quarter of 2023, where by rewarding reasoning incrementally through the process of mathematical problem solving, they're able to get language models to do much better on math by just kind of, you know, giving a, a lot finer grained reward signal step by step, rather than just saying like, did you get it right or wrong, you know, at the end uh, and rewarding that. I think that is kind of sparse reward problem or like just sparse, you know, you don't get many rights. <laughs> so how do you kind of get it on the right track when basically it's wrong all the time in the early days? They had this problem with web agents too, when they started off trying to do a, a web agent some years ago, they basically just found like, we're not getting any positives. So, you know, we have nothing to reward. And so it kind of didn't work. 
but you know, rewarding incrementally earlier definitely seems to be a, a big trend toward more reliable performance. So those are just some, you know, reference points, uh, triggers in my own mind that I, I think I can kind of understand a little bit better in light of this history. The other big thing that I'm kind of wondering, this is maybe a question we could ask across all five breakthroughs, but particularly here, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, there seems to be like a cluster of breakthroughs, you know, and there's a lot of discussion right now in AI too, about the, the notion of emergence, which is to say, you know, and there's a lot of definitional questions about emergence as well. So without necessarily trying to provide the proper definition of emergence, one candidate definition is that certain capabilities come online suddenly. And so, you know, we can look at like loss curves and say, you know, the loss curve is kind of dropping smoothly, but sometimes these individual capabilities seem to come up comparatively much faster. And there's a lot of debate as to, you know, whether that's exactly happening, or maybe you, if you look at it the right way, you can still find a smooth loss curve for a lot of these things, et cetera. But I guess I wonder, like, how sharp do you think these breakthroughs are? Do you have a mental model for so one thing happened and it unlocked these other things? But, you know, because I could, you could also say, well, 3D spatial model, modeling sounds like a pretty good candidate for a breakthrough, right? So, so I think this, this was the task of, this is why I look at the whole book as a first approximation, because it is clearly the case that all of these were broken down into small incremental generation by generation changes. Um, no, it was not the case, of course, that a nematode, two nematodes had a baby and then a fish was born, right? So the goal, the goal is to, which there is some almost some tastes that comes into this where other people could have different tastes and, and look at the same story and say, I think I would look at this as seven different steps as opposed to five, or I would look at this as three steps. And I think all could be equally right. You're, it's a trade-off between complexity and predictive power, right? And so I think 3D spatial modeling may have emerged at a separate, at importantly separate time period. We are, part of this taste is constrained by the evidence we have available today. So for example, we don't have good existing animals that show the gradual developments between nematodes and vertebrates. There's only a few chordates still alive, which are non-vertebrate chords. So in other words, non-vertebrate animals that are not yet in, not exactly invertebrates. So like in this middle ground, there's very few of those animals alive, and there's not a lot of comparative psychology studies on them. We don't have really good comparative psychology studies on the most primitive vertebrate, which is the lamprey. So we don't I have, I've tried tirelessly to find this. I don't think we even know if they have map-based navigation. So it would be a fascinating finding if we found that a lamprey is incapable of knowing locations in space, but a teleost fish is. That would suggest that there was an important milestone that occurred between the first vertebrates and the first jawed vertebrates, as an example. So, so the, po the point is we're, we're constrained a little bit on trying to come up with a first approximation that gives us a basic understanding of the steps by which things evolved without adding so much complexity that we lose the, the intuition. The goal is a first approximation, not exact accuracy. And we're also constrained by the evidence we have available, which is we don't have rich uh, comparative psychology studies across all of these diverse species. And many of the animals that would show us the gradual development of brains are died out. So we don't even, we don't have modern animals that show what these intermediary steps would be, but you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, the basal ganglia clearly evolved in steps. The cortex evolved in steps. Um, you know, these things probably did not all emerge all at once, hundred percent. But I, I do think there's insight to be garnered by even looking at the clustering of within this 50 million a year window, you get all of these things coming at similar times. And I think there is insight to garner about how do these things actually relate to each other. And what I found so interesting about writing the story in the book is it is often the case, not always, but often the case that suites of new abilities that seem to emerge at a given lineage tend to come from common and similar underlying neural structures and algorithms. And that's really interesting because what seems like very different things are actually different applications of the same sort of sort of a technique. And I think this actually emerges far more with breakthroughs three and four, where you see that a lot of the new abilities that emerge in mammals are in fact, or could be conceived as different applications of really one new algorithm or new ability that emerged. Vertebrates are a little bit harder because there's like very differing types of ability, like map-based navigation, pattern recognition, and trial and error learning. But those are all very interrelated. For example, pattern recognition is not relevant unless you have trial and error learning. 
if you don't have the ability to learn that this arbitrary pattern is something I should do this behavior to, then it's not going to be particularly useful to be able to recognize a pattern unless I have some clever mechanism to map the recognition of this thing to what behavior should I take in response to it. So they are related. It's also not very useful to have arbitrary trial and error learning unless I can recognize rich things in the world because I'm constrained to the tiny amount of sensory neurons in a nematode, this deep, very expensive brain to learn to take arbitrary behaviors where I can't even recognize much about the world at all is probably not that relevant. It's probably cheaper to just toss that away and stick with a simple low energy brain that can't do that. You can see why these things benefit from each other. But yeah, definitely do not think it happened where like one generation emerged and then all these abilities were there. Yeah. Help me understand that just a little bit better. This may be a probably is. I mean, there's a lot obviously of, of major divergences between the biological intelligences and the artificial intelligences. But I sort of could imagine a, especially, you know, taking a little bit more of an AI lens on things for a second. If I go back to the worm, I could imagine like bolting a, a convnet detector onto the side of it, you know, that would kind of pattern match on a predator or something, right? And and feed that signal into the rest of the, the system to say, get the hell out of here because I just recognized like the face of a predator or something, right? Now that may just be implausible to develop, but you know, obviously there's like, these are small things. They don't have a lot of luxury of, you know, carrying around extra weight, but it, it does seem like you could have value in these detectors, higher order detectors still without the reinforcement, but I might be missing something there. So I suppose we did that. I think what you would suffer from is the same problem that Minsky had with his snark. So if you don't have the ability to reinforce yourself on the basis of changes in expected future reward, it's not so clear that you're going to end up having intelligent behaviors emerge. Because if I can recognize something and the only way I'm learning about it is whether something good or bad happened within a small window of two seconds. I mean, this, the nematode, simple bilaterians, their associative learning is constrained to effectively a two second window. So they can make associations between a bright light and something bad happening. So they get a tap to their side or something painful, and then they are more likely to recoil or turn away from that light in the future, but it has to happen within two seconds. So contingencies beyond that two seconds are not learned because they don't have this arbitrary reinforcement and trial and error system. So maybe it would be valuable, but this is now we're into energy trade-offs, which is how valuable is it to be able to have this con convnet that maps to turn towards or away when all you can do is make a mapping within two seconds of something occurring relative to the energy costs of that thing. So there's one, maybe one outcome is it's not energetically worth and that's why it didn't evolve. Um, the other outcome could simply be that it's just not evolutionarily available where some other things had to happen that were are just lost to time to get the brain complex enough where this type of pattern matching is even possible. In other words, the reason that didn't happen is not because it wouldn't have been useful because of evolutionary constraints. You needed to have a bigger body. You needed uh, to have a bigger base brain with more complex motor behaviors. You know, who knows what very basic neurobiology had to be there for that to be an available iteration to emerge. Because the thing that's really interesting about evolution is each iteration needs to be adaptively valuable or at least not adaptively uh, uh, bad, right? So it's possible to have things that emerge that are sort of what's called sort of a spandrel where it's not, it's not adding adaptive value yet, but it evolved for some other reason. And then later it'll have value, but for something really energetically costly, it's unlikely to emerge unless each iteration adds value. So that puts a big constraint, which is you need to conceive. This is why understanding how lens-shaped eyes evolved is still such a fascinating thing, which is it's this incredibly complex structure. But what is the incremental steps by which every step of the way were, were either neutral or positive on adaptive value? So, but yeah, I think I think it's that would be my thinking around why maybe the early bilaterians didn't just add a convolutional neural network. <laughs> cool. This certainly does have interesting implications for the relative evolutions of AIs versus biological systems. It just, it strikes me that, you know, the separation of hardware and software is so, I mean, you, there's a possibly a distinction to be made in, on the biological side there too, but certainly on the AI side, it's like that distinction is so complete that these questions of like, does something have to be energy, you know, justified? We don't have to maintain homeostasis in, in AI systems. Like there's just a lot more sort of 
degrees of freedom and ability to kind of, you know, remix with without concern, you know, for these practical constraints. Which is why an interesting reason why I think it's likely, you know, in the near term, at least we're going to see meaningful divergence between the way that our AI systems work and the way biological brains work. And this is where I think there is a fair, a, a very fair critique of, you know, we need to have good tastes when we take inspiration from neuroscience and apply an AI because neuroscience, the way brains work as magical as they are, is a process that is constrained in ways we don't need in our AI systems. For example, we perhaps have access to far more energy and we're willing to be way less energy efficient. And so that means that the parts of the brain that are optimized for energy efficiency, perhaps at least in the near term, don't matter to us. So we're, it's not worth the like tireless effort to try and figure out how brains do that. Brains also have huge evolutionary constraints. So it's very likely that's not an optimal design versus when we implement things in, in silicon, maybe we can find an optimal design, throw away a previous design from scratch. So I think it's likely that we're going to end up with AI systems that work in very different ways because they don't have the same constraints that brains do. And so the, the taste question, uh, which is a hard one, I obviously don't have all the answers to, I have thoughts on, is what are the aspects of how brains work that are relevant, which is not obvious. The goal is clearly not to recreate the human brain wholesale, but what exists in the neuroscience of what we know about brains or don't yet know that we think will be useful and practically relevant to building smart AI systems. That's sort of the, the hard question. Okay, cool. Well, let's do the next three breakthroughs still. And then I have some, you know, some direction uh, that I want to take us down on, on some of those future oriented questions too. All right. So these will, I think, go faster because they're actually in some ways algorithmically more complicated, but conceptually much simpler. So in mammal brains, which evolved during the era of dinosaurs. So there's a really interesting story, which I won't go into on like how you know, the story of how we went from fish to little squirrel-like mammals is a fascinating one. The series of extinction events, making our way onto land, dinosaurs emerging, this whole rich history with that. Um, but eventually, around 150 million years ago, we find ourselves as little four-inch long mammals in an ecosystem with gargantuan, massive dinosaurs. We are very close to the bottom of the food chain. We're hiding in burrows, only coming out at night to hunt for insects and then run back inside. But what is fascinating is inside this tiny little brain evolved a new structure, an area of the cortex of early vertebrates, which is a three-layered structure. So if you looked at a lamprey brain and you looked at the cortex, there's sort of three layers of neurons wrapped around each other. But if you look into any mammal brain from human to monkey to rat, you see a structure of their cortex, which has six layers. And this is called the neocortex, which actually on the edges goes back to the old structures, which three layers. So the olfactory cortex of mammals still has three layers, just like early vertebrates. And the hippocampus of mammals still has three layers like early vertebrates. But this neocortex this area in between got really, really much more complicated. And so the question is, what did this new neocortex do? And so in human brains, this is where evolution, I think, is so interesting and instructive. Because if all we did is study human brains, we would say the neocortex does practically everything. I mean, if you go into the brain of a human, pretty much everything that you consciously experience seems to occur in the neocortex. For example, if you get a concussion uh, to the back of your head, which is the, the visual cortex. So the, the neocortex is this sh six layer sheet around the whole brain, all the folds you see when you look at a picture of a brain, that's neocortex. And there's different subregions that seem to do different things. As an example, the back region is called the, the visual cortex. And if you get damaged, the visual cortex, people will report being blind. So they will say, I cannot see anything. And if you weave, they will not respond. But we know that their body is, their brain is still processing visual information. For example, if you throw something at their face, they will blink. If you show up a scary picture in front of them, they will report feeling fear or their heart rate goes up, even though they won't be able to tell you why. And we know exactly why this occurs. It's called affective, it's called blind sight. And we know this because the optic nerve goes into different parts of the brain. There's one pathway that goes uh, through the thalamus to visual cortex which seems to be the place where we consciously experience things, recognize rich objects, et cetera. Well, there's another path that goes directly to the amygdala, which is an older structure. There's a homologous region in vertebrates. 
which is sort of like a basic pattern detector, which can trigger emotional responses. So the neocortex seems to be where like all the complex stuff is happening that you consciously experience, but there's still lots of other older regions of the brain that are doing stuff. If you go to the front part of the neocortex, there's areas, there's a ring called motor cortex. If that gets damaged and in a stroke, you become paralyzed, you lose your fine motor skills. There's regions in the brain that at least classically have been language areas. If you get those damaged, you lose the ability to speak or to understand language. There's auditory areas. So when you look at the human brain, it's like, man, this one structure seems to do everything and enables it complex movement, planning, uh, object recognition, all that stuff. But if you go all the way back to early mammals, if you look at a, a, a rat, it's not so clear how important their neocortex is to all those things. For example, you can lesion a rat's motor cortex and it can still move around just fine. The paralysis associated with motor cortex damage is actually unique to primates. And I think that's a fascinating finding because what it suggests is when we think about the, the neocortex as being able to do things like what's where we control movement, there might be something more complicated going on because when we go back to early mammals, it wasn't the region that controlled movement. That was actually an adjustment over evolutionary time. So when we go into a rat, what is the neocortex doing? Well, if you damage the motor cortex of a rat, they become unable to learn new motor skills, but they can execute well-learned motor skills and they become much worse at fine motor behaviors. In other words, things that require in real time motor planning. A cat becomes much less able to look out at a bunch of sort of small platforms and plan at steps of its paws throughout that. And so I think this is a very interesting suggestion that really what a motor cortex was originally doing is enabling things like motor planning. In other words, simulating your motions, your actions before you do them. And uh, this also goes to another area of research uh, around what the neocortex is doing, where people think about it as a generative model. In other words, it is a model that does two things. It can both recognize things in the world, but it can also generate its own samples of things in the world. And so the original intuition for this came from visual illusions that were identified in the 19th century, where I'm sure everyone is familiar with this, like you can show someone something that is ambiguously a cat or, or a rabbit or a duck, and you can, all, you can only see one or the other, or you can show someone like a Dalmatian set of patterns that they don't recognize, but then you say, actually, do you see the dog there? And then all of a sudden I can't not see the dog. Or there's examples where you show arbitrary images that people can't help but see a sphere or a triangle there, even though there's not in fact a triangle there. And so what all of these suggested, there's this guy, uh, Helmholtz, who came up with, he used different words, but his idea was perception as inference, which is what happens when we're seeing things in the world. What we're actually doing is we're trying to infer, we're trying to infer the true state. And then we use that as our prior when we predict net new things. Um, so in other words, uh, when we see this ambiguous picture of a triangle, if it were the case that there were in fact a triangle there, that would well predict the observation I'm seeing. And the reason why this is so important is if you think about an animal navigating in the dark, once I have a prior about, oh, I remember seeing the branches over there, I think I'm, I, I now have the, the base understanding that the world contains these branches. Even as I start moving, if the sensory stimuli doesn't prove to me that it's there, but is consistent with my prior, then I'm happy with it. I'll keep going with my prior until new information emerges. So this type of, this is the Bayesian brain hypothesis. This idea that we try to infer a, a model of the world, we try to infer what's the state of the world in my head, and then I'm going to hold that as a prior and compare predictions from this against what actually happens. You know, there's a lot of evidence that's what the neocortex is doing. And so a lot of people talk about this neocortical generative model in the through the lens of it being really good at things like object recognition, which you know, clue the neocortex is good at. But I think from an evolutionary lens, a sort of alternative way to look at it is perhaps what's mo most useful about the neocortex is not the uh, recognition mode, which is the mode where I'm receiving sensory stimuli and comparing it to my prior about the world, but the generation mode, which is I'm cutting myself off from the actual world and I'm exploring the representation of the world and generating my own data. In other words, simulating possible things. And, and the reason why I think from an evolutionary lens, this, this is really interesting. It, it's hard to argue. I think it's hard to argue. One could argue this, but I think it's hard to argue the neocortex evolved for object recognition because without a neocortex and a lot of vertebrates that just have a three-layered uh, cortex are 
unbelievably good at object recognition. And they can do it with 3D per- perturbations and 3D rotation. Like they, they, all the things that we would think a good object recognition system should do, fish seem eminently able to do. So it's certain, it's, unless you argue there's some energy efficiency or there is some unique improvement in performance that neocortex offers, I think it's sort of hard to argue that the driving adaptive value of neocortical evolution was superior recognition. I think what's much more compelling and consistent would be it was the first time when animals could actually render a simulation of a state of the world that's not the current one. In other words, building a model of the world based on experiencing and perception by inference, but then having the ability to pause and play out possible futures before I act. And, and that is something that we do see in across mammals. So if you take a, a rat and you put it in a maze, unlike fish, it's, you know, we haven't found this yet in fish. So it would be a, a fascinating observation. If we did, this is where a lack of comparative uh, psychology studies, you know, creates challenges, but with mammals, we know this happens. If a rat navigating a maze and you'll see it, if there's a choice points, you'll see a rat pause and actually look back and forth. And so this has been, uh, was called vicarious trial and error as a hypothesis, this view that rats seem like they're thinking about their possible actions before they make a choice, but it was a hypothesis. There's no way to verify that rats are actually doing this until this guy, David Reddish came around and actually recorded parts of the hippocampus, which if you remember from early vertebrates, render uh, maps of space. And there's, there's certain neurons in the hippocampus called place cells. Um, so as a rat navigates around a, a maze, there are specific neurons that activate at each location in that maze. You can actually look into a rat and see, oh, there's a neuron that detects that no matter where, which direction they come from, it's always going to activate at this location in the maze. Same thing for this other location, et cetera. And so usually place cells are primarily active for the location that the rat is actually in. So as it's navigating the maze, you can see the place cells just change for the locations. in. But when it reaches these choice points and looks back and forth, you see something mind-blowing. The place cells cease to activate only the location they're at. You literally can watch it playing out possible futures. You can see the place cells start playing out different paths down the maze until it actually makes a decision. So you can watch rats imagine the future. And, and that's a really fascinating finding. And when you look at other abilities that you see emerge with mammals, it's consistent with this idea of being able to simulate states of the world that's not the current one. For example, counterfactual learning. So counterfactual learning is being able to learn what would have happened had I taken a different action. This is a key limitation with trial and error learning. In trial and error learning, you can only learn from the actual actions taken. So I think a very simple example of this is rock, paper, scissors. So if you have, if you teach a monkey to play rock, paper, scissors, if the monkey plays rock against paper and loses with trial and error learning, what you would expect is it's now going to punish the behavior of rock. So the next time it's going to be equally more likely to do paper or scissors because one of the three actions has been punished. But if it has counterfactual learning, if it can look at paper and say, well, if I had played scissors, I would have won the last round. In other words, if it's able to simulate possible actions, you would expect it to be more likely to play scissors. And if it was really, really smart, you would realize there's actually no relationship between these. So it's all random, which is what humans can realize. But what monkeys do is they become more likely to play scissors, which demonstrates an ability to consider what would have happened if, if I had done something different. And in, in rats, you can do sort of a similar thing where you can, uh, David Reddish did a study, I won't go into the details, but you can watch a rat actually play out different past choices and then change its decisions on the basis of it. You can go into the brain and watch its orbital frontal cortex rendering a different outcome had it actually made a different choice. You can literally watch that happen, um, which in orbital frontal cortex, another region of neocortex. The other thing that emerges is something called episodic memory. This is a loaded term. Some people call it episodic-like memory, but the idea to render past events, which we also see in, in rats, which lots of recent studies have shown episodic memory, remembering the past is actually the same process as imagining the future. Because all we're doing is we're rendering another state of the world that's not the current one. So this idea, and again, in this breakthrough model, what I think is so cool is you cannot have simulation without reinforcing. It is not, there is no way to benefit yourself from imagining possible futures unless you have some mechanism by which to change your behavior based on those outcomes. For a rat to be able to say, let me imagine possible futures and then reinforce the ones where I get the best outcome in my imagination, you need the same apparatus that's learning through trial and error. And you see this when you go into brains as they imagine possible futures, they're effectively reinforcing themselves vicariously based on their imagination. And thus, then when they go back into acting, they're playing out their imagined 
action sequence. So uh, the hypothesis here is that the neocortex evolved. It gave a new abil- mechanism for perception, perception by inference, but the core adaptive value is the ability to simulate a, a model of the world, um, which we see across mammals. And this is why mammals are good at fine motor skills because you know a cat can plan where to place its paws before it does so. Versus a lizard, if you watch you know, a lizard run, there's lots of evidence, just they're not actually planning their movements ahead of time. That's why, you know, most non-mammalian vertebrates, with the exception of birds, are quite clumsy because they don't have this sort of ability. I'm sorry. So the neocortex seemed to enable simulation, which was again bootstrapped on the the trial and error learning, which we see emerge in neocortex. Yeah, this is kind of where I guess the, I don't know if you would agree with this characterization, but it seems like we have pretty good AI versions of the reinforcement learning breakthrough at this point. That's to say there couldn't be further improvement and sample efficiency and so on, but it like largely works on this one. And then on the next one, we're kind of in the, in the realm of like frontier AI capability. We can sort of squint and see that we can kind of get language models to do some of this simulating if we set it up and scaffold it the right way. And you have like techniques like chain of thought, and then that gets elaborated into tree of thought. And there's the kind of, well, you know, let me go down this path and then this path, let me eva- you know, evaluate those paths. So there is something pretty analogous there, although it's it feels like kind of a hack by comparison. Maybe a broad question is like, how would you compare and contrast the state of AI simulation counterfactual ability versus biology? And also specifically within the biological systems, where do how much do we know about like how you get into the sort of counterfactual mode so it's almost like there must be some sort of switch or gating mechanism and how do the inputs for the hypotheticals get generated i'm a little bit you know if i'm if i'm when i'm thinking about my like range of possible futures there's this like fundamental mystery of like where do the starting points even kind of arise from and then i can kind of i i, I know what i think it feels like to follow those down a simulated path, but like how I even got onto these various simulated paths, it, it, you know, I don't really feel like I have access to that. Lots of fun thoughts there. So, so planning in general. So the, the notion of simulating possible futures is a very old idea. I mean, in the fifties, we were building systems that would engage in some form of planning. It's not the existence not the ex- of planning that's missing. It's how do we do planning in a way that works in practice? And we haven't really that's that's the nuance and the question is are we a few architectural tweaks away from that so will you know open ai's a tree of thought system actually get us very far it's possible or is there some fundamental aspect of how mammalian brains do it that's missing and that's also possible that we're just missing some key insight so i think one thing that is clearly different and that's going on in in mammal brains i don't know the open question on like how far away this is an ai but in mammal brains, there's this, it's, you're continually active and you're switching between these behavioral modes, as you're saying. So in mammal brains, you have this sort of what might be called model free, which means I'm not actually simulating possible futures. I'm just directly responding to the stimuli I'm getting. Defaults, which you know, Kahn, Daniel Kahneman would say like fast thinking. This is like the immediate response to stimuli. And we are going through that process. And then sometimes, for some reason, we intelligently decide when to stop and think. So that's the first intellectual thing that somehow mammal brains are cleverly deciding when is this a choice point that I'm going to think about. I have a general thesis on this, which I don't think I'm sure there are other people that have this idea, where it's some notion of uncertainty measurement that drives this pausing. And so uncertainty could be measured in different ways. It could be measured in the basal ganglia, where there's divergent predictions of model-free actions. It could be measured in the neocortex, which is uncertainty and a generative prediction about the next day of the world. We don't know yet that yet. But uncertainty triggering pausing, I think there's some good evidence that that is is something that's going on in male brains. Then there's the question of how do I prune the search space to select possible futures to evaluate, which is your question of like, when you pause and think, you're obviously not doing a comprehensive search of all the possible futures. That was ridiculous. So how do mammal brains actually cleverly prune the search space in three-dimensional three-dimensional world? This is one of the leading problems in robotics, which is the uh, the dimensionality of controlling even a basic robot arm is gargantuan, right? The the actuators and all the, the locations of where you put all the fingers and the arms, it's just such a gargantuan search space that people have not yet figured out how do you prune that thoughtfully so that it can plan movements at a time. A lot of research going into that. And then the last question is how do you decide which outcome you select? 
And so how do you evaluate possible outcomes after you're simulating? It's not just the notion of planning, but there might be unique breakthroughs in each of these steps or unique sort of technical insights that we need to find and then bring into other systems. Now you could imagine, I mean, I could imagine chaining together an LLM to do each of these things, right? You could imagine just giving an LLM, you know, a small model, a, a set of stimuli and just say, should you simulate? Should you simulate? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. If yes, then you engage a, a tree of thought LLM that then selects things and you have another LLM that's evaluating the outcome saying, is it accurate? Is it? So you could imagine chaining together an LLM to do these three steps. Question is how well will it work? I'm sure we'll find that out soon. But I think, so I think for, for, for the way that simulating works in the mammal and the mammalian brain, I think one of the key things I, I believe that we're going to have to figure out in, uh, in the AI systems is this notion of continual learning. This is where I think the big next insight, like if I were to do more neuroscience research, this is where I would focus my time because what happens with LLMs, and this goes to their lack of episodic memory too, is I can't talk to it and it just remembers as I'm speaking to it um, versus, you know, I can t- explain a new concept to you and now you just know it. And you didn't forget all the things you knew before. This notion of catastrophic forgetting has been a problem in deep neural networks for a very long time. I um, mean, this is why we don't let weights get updated continuously with new information because we know it risks catastrophically losing its abilities. We see this in fine tuning. You know, I've been doing a lot of fine tuning experiments for a variety of different things I've been working on on the side. And the problem with fine tuning is you very quickly get this overfitting issue where I mean, it ends up overfitting to the small fine tuning data set and it loses its generalization. It's forgetting old tasks that it was able to do. This is a, this is a not like a, I don't think this is a, a, a nuanced edge case. I think this is a foundational problem with the way these models work. And so how does the mammal brain decide when to incorporate new information and how to add it to my model of the world without interfering with other information is a huge outstanding area of research that I think will is a key difference between how mammal brains are sort of simulating and modeling the world and how existing AI systems are doing it. We have some unique ideas in neuroscience. For example, it seems to be the case that it's possible that weights are only updated in inf- in times of surprise or new information. So there's some suggestion that there are certain neuromodulators that get released only in moments where you have failed predictions, which then sort of douse synapses and in a neuromodulator that enables them to update their weights. So one way we reduce catastrophic forgetting is we're not actually continually learning everything. Only in certain instances do we update weights. Another another thing that I think is unique that people haven't really figured out is this like sort of eureka moment that happens with with humans, where if you teach me something that's confusing, I don't just incorporate it into my model of the world which happens with a neural network. I can give a neural network, a, a transformer, any fine tuning data set I want, even if the data set makes no sense relative to its prior information, and it will just start learning because I'm pra- back propagating through. If you tell me one plus one equals four, and you start trying to explain that concept to me, I'm not just going to take that as fine tuning data. I'm going to take my model of the world and then desperately try and grasp how the information you're telling me fits into my model of the world. And until I get it, I'm going to reject the information. It doesn't make sense in my model of the world. And so something nuanced is happening where we have, this is where robustness is clearly occurring in mammalian brains. There's something where I, I reject new information unless I can somehow fit it into my established, rich, and robust existing model of the world. And somehow this is enabling, I think, a more generalization across tasks, and somehow this is enabling continual learning in a more robust way because we're not just arbitrarily letting new information update weights. But how that actually works, I don't think we know yet. But yeah, that would be my like sort of sidebar on what I think is missing uh, in AI systems that exist somewhere in the brain of mammals. Yeah, that's very interesting. And that does bring to mind the state space model moment for me as well, which you know, in the interest of time, we'll, I'll keep this brief, but I had a long monologue about it late last year. And basically, I think it at least promises a partial answer to some of these challenges where the basically the addition of a state, which is long lived and propagates through time, creates kind of a third aspect of the the overall system, right? In the in the transformer, you've got the weights and you've got the inputs and it's kind of input and output. But the addition of the state gives you kind of this extra thing that can store information, can kind of evolve through time without having the weights themselves have to change. You have this kind of additional degree of freedom in terms of how you want to store information, how you want to represent it. And the, the Mamba paper, which kind of triggered me to go 
you know, down the rabbit hole on this for a little while, crossed the threshold of basically being as expressive, you know, achieving very similar high level loss metrics to transformers, but doing it in a way that A, is a lot more efficient computationally, but B also has this like additional thing where you can encode memories longer term. I think we're still in the very, very early phases of figuring out how we're going to use the state space models and in the, you know, broader architecture of AI systems. I don't think it's just like a replacement. You know, if there's anything to learn from this five, well, there's a lot of things to learn. I don't mean to diminish it, but one thing I definitely take away from the five breakthrough model is that we still have all the earlier breakthroughs, right? We did not, you know, when people say, is this going to be the thing that kills the transformer? I think one thing you could take away from this history of the bio- biological intelligence is like, probably not. It's probably something that gets combined to and you know remixed with and hybridized with the existing capabilities and adds something new. And then over time, you know, that will evolve further and maybe bleed together and become, you know, inseparable even maybe, but it doesn't feel like we are, when you think about like, is this going to totally replace that? That seems like a very rare and kind of temporary, you know, strange time in the evolution of these things more so now, now we have this like new ability and it's the, another thing you said too, is like when, when to accept and when to reject information, the mechanism of the Mamba paper, they call it the selective state space model. Earlier state space models just had, I don't want to speak for all state space models, but broadly an explicit encoding of the history. So you're just compressing with a known engineered algorithm, all history into a state to the best of your ability. You can have different trade-offs there. You know, do you want to remember recent stuff more? Or do you want to wait all history the same or whatever? But the selective mechanism now allows you to update the state depending on the overall dynamics. So you're not just explicitly accepting any new information in with a a hard-coded encoding, but if stuff sort of, you know, doesn't jive, right, or doesn't seem relevant, then you can just kind of not update the state accordingly. I think we're probably going to see a lot of little variations on the, first of all, like multi-state models, and then a lot of little variations on the selective mechanisms to sort of figure out like, you know, do we need like a bucket, a state to like put all the outliers in, you know, or a, a state to, you know, whatever, there'll be a lot of things there. But I do think this third breakthrough and some of the, some of your comments about it definitely suggests to me that the, yeah, which I, I already believed coming in, but it, I see a lot of parallels to what the state-based models may unlock for AI systems as a whole. Number four is mentalizing. Cool. All right. I'll try to make the fast paced. So mentalizing, so when we look at primates, this is an area where the comparative psychology gets more controversial. So I'll try and caveat things where in general, most uh, primatologists or comparative psychologists would agree with this, but some would disagree because you know there's a lot of debates around um, what non-human apes are capable of doing, et cetera. Um, but there are three abilities that you see at least good consensus around or at least some evidence for within non-human primates that are consistently not found in non-primate mammals and other animals. And so this is sort of a a good uh, way to try and back into what evolves in early primates. So one is this idea of theory of mind. And so a theory of mind is this idea of I can try and infer what your intent is based on observing your actions or try to infer what knowledge you have on the basis of what I can see you doing. And so there's lots of really cool studies with non-human primates where you can see these types of things emerge. For example, there are studies where if you let a chimpanzee play with two different goggles, one goggle that you put on, you can't see through and one goggle you can see through. And then you let two human experimenters put these goggles on and they both hold food. The chimpanzee always goes up to the one with the goggles they can see through. So somehow they're inferring and there's no reason why you would expect any sort of sort of Pavlovian association with one of them or the other. But clearly there's some association of this person can see me and this other person can't. Another good example that you see in non-human primates is there's a study of them inferring the difference between people intentionally doing something versus not. So uh, there's been studies where you teach a, a, a non-human primate that of the two boxes placed in a room, the one with a red marker mark on it is the one with food in it. So you train them th- about that fact. Then you have an experimenter come in and bend over and, and mark one of them and then stand up and then pretend to accidentally mark the other one. In other words, drop the marker. Stimulus is identical. Um, they always go to the one that was intentionally marked. 
So there's some notion of the humans are giving me this food, and this is the one they meant to mark. So I'm ignoring the one that it was an accident, which is really hard to understand without some notion of I understand what you're intending to do. There's been lots of experiments like this where they, one of my favorite ones, which is a little bit less rigorous, more of an anecdote, but I think it, it beautifully describes how rich the lives of non-human primates are. This guy, Emil Menzel, was doing studies trying to just show the presence of map-based learning in, I think it was chimpanzees. And so what he would do is there's a sort of one acre forest these chimpanzees were living in, and he would show one of the chimpanzees, hey, I'm going to put food behind this little morsel, uh, this little morsel of food under this bush. And then just see if the, the chimpanzee would go back to the same location. And it, okay, great. He learned that obviously they go back to the same location. But then he started observing something that he did not expect, which is when I think her name was Belle, uh, that chimpanzee started sharing the food with the other members of the group. There was another a chimpanzee named Rock that ended up being really mean and taking all the food from her. So she started trying to trick him. She would wait till he looked away and then go and get the food. So then he started intentionally looking away. So she would go to the food and then he would turn around and run after it. Then she started trying to lead him in the wrong direction until he was far enough away and then she'd run back. There was a cycle of deception, counter deception that folks have found with primates, which is only really possible to conceive of if what's happening is I'm trying to trick you by changing the knowledge in your head. I'm trying to give you information that's wrong. So you think one thing so I can do something else. And this is a, incredibly hard to imagine how someone would, an animal would do this without some notion of understanding the mind and intentions of others. So that's one new ability we see with Unprize. The other one is uh, imitation learning. So uh, non-human primates are really good. Remember those studies with uh, really good imitation learning. Remember those studies with Edward Thorndike, where uh, it's sort of hard to find imitation learning in the animal kingdom. Uh, but with, with non-human primates, they do it exceptionally well. You can teach, or they've done studies where they take one member of a, a primate group and they teach it to do this special trick with a rake to get food. And then they send the primate back out into the world. And pretty soon all of the whole troop is using the same exact technique. So they're cool. It's like very clear evidence that they're learning through observation. There's also some evidence. This is more controversial that chimpanzees do actively cheat teach. So they have seen, you know, there's been some new evidence that chimpanzees will literally correct the mistakes of youngsters when they're trying to do things like termite fishing, which also clearly requires an understanding of what someone else's knowledge is and how to modify the knowledge. And so, okay, so we have theory of mind. We see this improved imitation learning emerge in primates. And then the other one, which is the least evidence for, but there is some evidence for that primates are uniquely good at what's called anticipating future needs, where they can, they can take an action today for a need that they don't currently experience. Humans do this all the time. We go to the grocery store, we buy food for the week, even though I'm not hungry at all right now. And as obvious as that seems to us, it's actually quite challenging to understand how animals do that. And they did, one of my favorite studies on this was done comparing squirrel monkeys and uh, rats. And what they did is they said they're going to give each of these animals a choice between two options. One option is a low treat option. So it's either dates or raisins. But if they go with that route, they get water right afterwards. The other is a high treat option, but they don't get water for a long period of time. And they baseline these between the two animals to make sure that they were quantifying it to induce a similar amount of thirst. And so the point is, am I willing to give forego the high treat option because I know in the future I'm going to be thirsty, even though I'm not thirsty right now? Um, and what they found is squirrel monkeys would do that. They would go with the low treat option, but rats would not. So some suggestion that they're capable of anticipating future needs. So, okay, you have these three seemingly totally distinct abilities. Um, and if you go into the brain of, new, of primates, you don't see a very different brain from early uh, mammals. Uh, there's really two main things that change other than size. The brain obviously is meaningfully bigger, um, but they got an area of frontal cortex called granular prefrontal cortex. And then they have a few subregions of posterior sensory cortex that's, you know, that are new. And if you look at the connectivity, um, a reasonable first approximation is what these, these areas of a neocortex are doing is they're, they get input from older areas of mammalian neocortex. In other words, um, it seems to be building a model of the older model. It's a hierarchical layer above it. For example, a granular prefrontal cortex that exists in early mammals that exists in rats gets sensory input directly from areas like the hippocampus and the amygdala. And if you look at granular prefrontal cortex, it gets none of it. It only gets information from a granular prefrontal cortex. So you can think about it as sort of a hierarchical layer above. And sort of the idea here is if you, and there was actually a big mystery about what these structures even did, because there was lots of early studies in the 20th century that showed people with damaged 
prefront granular prefrontal cortex didn't seem to be fine. In some cases they were like mostly normal other than their personality being weird. But then people started realizing that one of the main things they're really bad at is engaging with other people in a socially reasonable way because they really struggle on these theory of mind tasks. So if you start giving them tasks where they need to reason about the changing knowledge of other people, they become quite bad at it. One of my favorite studies on this is they compared people with damage to granular prefrontal cortex to baselines to damage to hippocampus. And they asked them to do something very simple. They said, just can you write a little story about some state of the world in the future? People with hippocampal damage could describe themselves in these imagined stories, but the the richness of the world was very basic. They couldn't describe key features of their imagined world. People with granular prefrontal damage were eminently capable of describing aspects of the world in the future, but they were always absent. They really struggled to imagine themselves in this imagined state of, of the world, um, which suggests that part of what's happening is it's the granular prefrontal cortex enables you to model you. Um, in other words, it's the source of metacognition, uh, thinking about thinking. And what's interesting is you see these three abilities emerge along with granular prefrontal cortex. They can actually be understood as three applications of the same thing. So modeling your own inner simulation is another is effectively creating a model of one's mind, enable, uh, able to simulate the simulation. Another way to think about this is being able to simulate thinking about different things. And so what that enables one to do is I can put myself in someone else's shoes because I can now imagine myself in a different situation and try and predict what would I know and what would I think. You can also much more easily learn through imitation because I can see someone doing a behavior and I can imagine myself doing the same behavior and vicariously train myself doing it and figure out what their intention is. One of the key things with imitation learning is you can't just wholesale copy. In the interest of time, I won't go into this whole area, but there's a really fascinating area of imitation learning in AI where what we found is one of the key things to making imitation learning work is not direct copying, but inferring the intent of the behavior in someone else. In other words, what are they trying to do? And then vicariously reinforcing yourself to do what they're trying to do. That's a key thing that makes imitation learning work, um, which would explain why primates able to simulate uh, someone else's intentions become very good at imitation learning. And anticipating future needs, you could conceive of this simply as for me to imagine myself being hungry, I need to be able to simulate myself in a different mind state than my current one. In other words, I need to be able to imagine just like I would try to figure out why is person A acting this way? They must be really thirsty because when I do that, uh, the reason is because I'm thirsty. I can also imagine, well, what, what am I going to feel if I take this action? Oh, I know I'm going to be thirsty because I can simulate that behavior and I know I'm going to regret and want this other thing. I'm going to engage in counterfactual learning and be upset. So actually what I'm going to do is take a different choice. So, so what I think is cool about sort of this breakthrough four idea is you see one common suite of things happen in the neocortex, which seems to model the self. And you see three new abilities emerge, which can be conceived of as a first approximation as just different applications of the same thing, which is simulating your own inner simulation. Mechanistically, how does this actually work? Can we, is, is what I'm describing rich enough in detail to create sort of an algorithmic blueprint to build as an AI? Definitely not. Um, but in principle, it suggests that modeling the simulation itself might unlock some interesting things. It also suggests some interesting things in how we relate to AI systems. If what I'm saying is correct, and I'm not the only one that conceived of this, but if the general story I'm telling is correct, one of the key grounding constraints that enables humans to engage and relate to each other is the fact that our brains are not that different. Because there is a synergy between me imagining myself in your shoes being a relatively good proxy for how you actually will feel. And there's lots of cognitive biases that we see happen where I, I try to project things onto other people when they don't feel that way just because I would. And this is, you know, our differences do create problems with this sort of mental projection. But if we create an AI system with a brain that works woefully differently than humans, then we're going to perhaps need very different mechanisms to ensure that they understand why we're doing certain things and the intent of what we say. Because the way in which human brains pull that off is at least in part, I think, based on the idea that we have similar reward structures and similar mechanisms by which the, the brain works so that this sort of mental projection on average tends to be relatively effective at predicting what's going on in the brains of others. Yeah. Theory of mind is a fascinating topic in every dimension. It, I've done a, a little bit of a deep dive at one point into, you know, just how good is the, like GPT-4's theory of mind for humans. And 
you know, it's still controversial, but I would say it's definitely off the, you know, it's off the zero line at this point, quite clearly. And then, you know, our theory of mind of AIs is also like, an, you know, extremely, maybe even more difficult in some ways, because our instincts for understanding them are so often misled by our instincts for understanding ourselves and, and one another. We'll keep then the fifth breakthrough, which is speaking for the book. People can, can read, uh, or I listened actually to the audiobook, which I recommend. How about some just very kind of high level conceptual questions? I guess one that stands out to me is the architecture of biological brains is like very messy, <laughs> you know, dense connections, not differentiable, right? Not like linear. It's this sort of mess that has all these kind of feedback loops that are kind of cyclical and, and all sorts of, you know, different geometries. AI much more linear. Everything has to be differentiable for backpropagation, at least in today's paradigms. We've got other kind of evolutionary paradigms, but they're not currently like, you know, advancing the state of the art nearly as much. Do you have an intuition for how that will shape up over time? Like, do we need more complicated geometries to achieve some of the advantages? I'm specifically thinking about like robustness, um, adversarial robustness that, that the biological systems seem to, to have at you know, a, a much stronger level than the AIs today. Backprop has been so like incredibly successful. The, the thing that brains might be doing that I, I would, it's hard pressed to argue that it's going to replace backprop, but it might be, it might add a modification to how back, backprop is used is brains seem to be doing clever about when weights are updated, which enables it to do continual learning. And I think one of the key things we're going to want is continual learning in these AI agents, being able to have them continuously get a stream of information and us be confident that they're not going to lose knowledge about prior things that it had information about. So in order to do this, the thing with backpropagation, it's almost too perfect because it updates all the weights to be the exact partial derivative relative to the gradient or if, you know, if you're doing, you know, stochastic or bat or like mini batch fine, it's not exactly right, but like it's a very accurate computation. The human brain might be doing something less accurate, but with some other trick that enables it to engage in continual learning. And so the answer, I, I would be surprised if the answer ended up being a wholesale, we don't do backprop at all anymore. We use this clever mechanism that we figured out the brain worked. But if we figure out the general principle on which how brains maintain representations robustly while learning, my hunch would be, my intuition would be, that we can apply that and still use backpropagation. For example, and this is definitely not the answer, but if it were the case that it was as simple as there's some measure of uncertainty and when uncertainty passes a threshold, there's some process of assimilation of this new information. So some active learning process of take the uncertain new object and try and manipulate it to understand until I feel like I've generated enough data that I, I understand the thing and then I go on with my, my life. In other words, there's a, an active learning process you could conceive of doing that with backpropagation, but what you're doing is you have some other mechanism by which there's a pause, a process activated where you're going to allow weights to be updated. Maybe there's a generative replay component where maybe we're going to learn that these AI agents have to sleep. There needs to be some mechanism, just like the brains, brains use, to maintain representations robustly where we're replaying things to make sure there's some consolidation. So it seems likely to me that to make continual learning and robustness work, there's going to be something new. And it's not clear to me whether it's going to come first from biology or first from AI, but my guess is there's going to be a beautiful cross-pollination. If it's discovered first in AI, it might end up being another Richard Sutton story where we go back into brains and realize brains are doing something quite similar to this. Or if someone goes first into brains and figures out something clever, and then we go to AI and we try to apply it. My guess is probably the ideas are already in neuroscience. There's so many ideas on how brains do this. It's it's some, it's going to take someone reading through that literature and coming up with you know a, a good, taking the right things from those ideas to implement them. So yeah, so I would, I would be very surprised if we end up in 10 years and it's like, we've come up with a completely new paradigm. We're not using backprop. It's not deep learning. I think that's, that's unlikely. I do think there's some interesting things that will go on with macro structures. So which is already sort of happening where a lot of the work that's been going on is on single models and we scale up a single model, single input output. And we know brains don't, don't do this. It's not just a broad soup of neurons. There's specialized subsystems that talk to each other in interesting ways.
If I imagine a world where we all have autonomous robots walking around our house, I think it's a reasonable prediction that that's not going to be a single model. There's going to be subsystems. There'll be some convnet that does object recognition. There'll be a language model. Maybe there'll be some separate world model system. Maybe there'll be some other continual learning episodic memory system. And these things sort of come together in a whole brain macro architecture that's not just one scaled up foundation model. Yeah. So many interesting little parallels and connections I'm drawing there, you know, very early language model things like the, the pause token, you know, think before you speak, I think that paper was called and the, the backspace seems to kind of relate where like you're getting out of distribution, your confidence is getting low. We're not yet at the point where we're like really figuring out how to internalize that. But with the backspace, you're just kind of like, I think I've taken a wrong stuff here. Let me back up and, you know, try a different path forward where I can hopefully stay more in distribution. I was just thinking too, very much along the lines of what you just said, that it seems like we, we lack the kind of robustness, the, the ability to move forward in the, in the broadest sense through, you know, the, the changing environment, right? That's kind of what the language models, despite all the scaffolding kind of can't do. But I think, I think about something like the open worm project, or I think recently, like the whole connectome for the fruit fly was mapped. And I start to think, geez, you know, what if you took that as a digital blueprint and started to Frankenstein it where you, you know, go in and maybe replace a neuron with a module or kind of like we talked about with, you know, bolt the combat onto, you know, in place of a a single, you know, food smell detector, you know, could you put sophisticated object recognition there? And you could almost imagine taking this like a high level architecture that sort of has the, you know, the, the right feedback loops already evolved, but then just like soup up a lot of the components and, you know, that could get extremely weird. Probably we're headed for a future of, you know, both powerful and weird <laughs> systems. That Does that seem like a viable path or do you expect things like that to start to happen? I still think it's going to take taste from the side of the modeler to take a connect of a fly brain and then figure out how to model it for the following reasons. Even knowing the connectome of a brain still only gives you a small percentage of understanding of what it's computing. Because even if you want to do a whole brain model of it, One, neurons have different base firing rates, different thresholds for firing, different firing modes between phasic and tonic. So just knowing that two neurons connect to each other doesn't tell you how it's going to translate information. Two, the the learning rates of synapses are totally different. So if you're on one dendritic spine versus another, if you're close to the soma, that has different effects. I don't know. I don't know specifically about the connectome of the of the fly brain, but if they don't have knowing what type of neuron is each, I would imagine they do. But if you don't know whether it's an excitatory, inhibitory, or neuromodulatory neuron, then you're not going to know what it actually is signaled across the connection. Um, If you don't know what receptor expression is on the post and presynaptic neurons. Um, you're not, it's not going to be easy to model how the synapses will in fact change. So all of that is to say that n- like knowing how things connect to each other doesn't actually give you enough information to do a wholesale model of how it will process information. So that means one of two things. One, we're eventually going to get to the point where we do have enough information to just wholesale model brain, which will be amazing, but knowing connectivity is not sufficient or It's going to take a model, which is probably going to end up happening first. It's going to take someone really great taste to say, okay, well, I'm going to guess that this is what this module is doing. And that's what this module is doing. And this is broadly the information that's being communicated between them. And so I'm going to take the basic idea of it and render a simulation of that and see if it behaves in a similar way to a fly brain. And I think that is, that's an interesting approach, but it's still going to take uh, some good intuitions from the sake of the model or given just knowing the connections is really not enough. Yeah. That reminds me of the the Wright brothers and their observations around, you know, the subtle movements of the bird wings as they were soaring. You know, they didn't obviously just go in and do surgery on birds, you know, but they were they were able to create something that was inspired by and captures some of the principles of, but obviously it's been a lot more, you know, extensible in important ways for us as well. Okay, so last one. Do you have a, a unified theory of value? or, you know, moral patienthood that you could apply to these five breakthroughs? Like how, how much should I care about a worm versus a fish versus a ape? And then, you know, if you'd be so bold, do you have any intuition for how that would extend to AI systems? Um, I, I have an intuition, but I, I don't want it to be used as a moral authority for how we should treat animals. So I'll describe my intuition, but I'm not an ethicist, so I don't claim to have actually thought through all of the 
philosophical implications. But my intuition is there is something important on the jump from a model-free reinforcement learning system to a model-based reinforcement learning system, in other words, mammals, um, which I think there's independent convergence with birds, by the way. So uh, it seems to be the case that birds independently evolve these different types of brain structures that do the same type of thing. So you know, I think birds seem to also have this. So there seems to be something unique about an animal that can actually pause and think about things and create a model of itself. Now, how that maps to the notions of consciousness and qualia and all of that, unclear, but it seems to be the case that qualia is rendered in the neocortex, which would be consistent with this idea of, or at least neocortex is essential to rendering of qualia, which would suggest that rats are experiencing the same thing. There might be something unique also that emerges with primates when you actually have an identity and a sense of self. My intuition, this is pure speculation. <laughs> My intuition would be that qualia, the experience of things, is something that evolves in mammals, which is separate from identity and thinking about who you are and your place in the world. And I would put more moral weight on the experience of things than the identity of things. So some basic speculative intuitions. When one is meditating, I am not... In fact, the, the joy of meditation is removing myself from obsessing over my identity, who I am, how I, you know, where I fit in the world and ruminating about ourself, which I would think is a very primate like activity and just engaging in raw perception by inference and experiencing the present, which is just not engaging in the simulation of other things, but only just rendering a simulation of the current state. And so I think that the experience of things is where things can be, one can suffer, right? So uh, whether or not I have a sense of self, I can still experience suffering. Um, and so again, all speculation, but to me, my intuitions lie in, you know, a rat really should have very similar moral weight to a human. If you believe that, you know, where things are, where moral weight is applied is in the actual experience of things. It doesn't need to have a, a notion of its own identity for it to feel pain and feel fear, et cetera. Whereas for a fish, yeah, I feel like the fish psychologist won't love this, but if I look into a fish brain, um, I don't see, it's hard to correlate uh, the same sorts of things because their brains look so different. But of course we could, we could find out that what's happening in the fish brain does correlate to what's happening in the mammal brain and then we'll realize we're committing atrocities. So there's risks associated with it. But if you're asking my speculative intuitions, I do think it's at least very hard to argue that humans have strong moral weight over non-human primates. I think that's a very hard argument to make. And I also, my intuitions would say it also would apply to mammals. In terms of AI systems, this is like the trillion dollar ethical question that people are, I think, not talking about. There's the question of how they treat us, which is a problem. But the question of how we treat them is usually problematic because we don't even know, I mean, we don't even have philosophical grounding to infer that anyone other than oneself is conscious. You know what I mean? We, the, o the only argument we really have, which is not based on observable data, is mechanistic similarity. I just say, it seems to be my consciousness emerges from this thing in my head. And I look in your brain, it looks quite similar. That's problematic because we're clearly not going to be able to apply that paradigm to AI systems. And I think most people in AI and, and in philosophy would hold the material materialism view, which is you don't need the biological gooey stuff of neurons to implement the same process. Um, so now we have this big, we have a challenge of how do we know when an AI system is now garnering ethical and moral weight? And I don't have good answers to that, but I do think that that is going to be an emergent challenge of the 21st century. Well, that could be a uh, possible challenge for you to take up in the next book. But for now, the book is A Brief History of Intelligence, Max Bennett, author, Thank you for being part of The Cognitive Revolution. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It is both energizing and enlightening to hear why people listen and learn what they value about the show. So please, don't hesitate to reach out via email at tcr at turpentine.co, or you can DM me on the social media platform of your choice. OmniKey uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount.